Hello and welcome. I am Beth Mischewski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Adawa, Sauk, Muskaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all our differences with Native peoples at the core of our efforts. This webinar and all of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars are certified green events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment. To find out more about certified green events through U of I, please visit sustainability.illinois.edu. To find out more about the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars or to sign up for our events mailing list, please visit istc.illinois.edu slash events. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing online in about a week. I'll be sending an email out to everyone who registered for the webinar once those are available. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and I'll be reading those to the speaker at the end. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Greg Kester. Greg is the director for the Renewable Resource Program at the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, or CASA. He serves as the technical and programmatic contact for CASA members and a conduit for emerging issues on state and federal levels on all biosolids, renewable energy, recycled waters, and related issues. He earned his bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Wisconsin and is a registered professional engineer in Wisconsin. Before joining CASA, he um, served as the state biosolids coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Greg was elected by his peers to represent all states in the nation on biosolids issues to the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And he also served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee, which evaluated federal biosolids regulations and produced a 2002 report, Biosolids Applied to Land, Advancing Standards and Practices. Prior to joining his, prior to earning his engineering degree, Greg drove an 18-wheel tractor tanker for 10 years, delivering liquid biosolids to agricultural fields and land for land application through direct injection, allowing him a holistic view of all sides of the biosolids program. So Greg, thank you for joining us and the webinar is yours. Thank you very much, Beth. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today and, uh, and talk with you all. Um, just a, a little uh, background on CASA. We're a nonprofit association uh, formed in 1956. Uh, we represent um, more than 125 public wastewater agencies throughout California, representing more than 90% of the uh, wastewater flow in the state. We also have uh, some 80 private firms uh, make, uh, making up our associate uh, membership representing engineering, uh, finance, technology, legal, and, uh, and management. Um, so we provide state and federal legislative advocacy, um, as well as regulatory expertise and engagement uh, within the state, and uh, try to communicate uh, those, those efforts. Um, to give you an overview of how biosolids are managed within California, uh, in 2020, we produced uh, roughly 658,000 dry metric tons of biosolids. 67% uh, of those were land applied um, <clears throat> or publicly distributed. 
uh, we still had 23% um, going to landfills. Um, most of that, well, it was about split in half of whether it was alternative daily cover or just buried at the landfill. I'll talk a lot more about that um, uh, going forward as well. Um, we have one incinerator in the state. Uh, there used to be two and one was decommissioned in 2019. There is one remaining. Um, we have five plants who utilize what's called surface disposal, but they represent a very small uh, percentage of the biosolids management. Uh, the city of Los Angeles has a deep well injection uh, site at their terminal island plant. Um, and that obviously is a very small amount as well. Um, and then we have some that goes to long-term treatment or storage. So just uh, to give everyone sort of a, a background on how biosolids are regulated, um, US EPA adopted risk-based uh, standards for uh, the use of biosolids in 1993, uh, chapter 40 of the Code of Federal Regulations, part 503. Um, the Clean Water Act is the authority under which these were uh, developed and that requires a biennial review uh, to be done, and that has been done every two years since 2003. That essentially looks to see whether there are either new constituents or uh, evolving science, uh, which would require um, other constituents to be regulated. Uh, in California, the State Water Resources Control Board adopted a programmatic environmental impact report and general order for the land application of biosolids in 2004. Um, so California is not delegated authority by EPA for the biosolids program. Only eight states in the nation are. And so what that means is that biosolids are duly regulated in California, both by EPA as well as the State Water Board. Um, both the regulatory frameworks, though, promote the land application of biosolids um, as a highly beneficial use. Uh, two reviews have been done by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, both of those have supported the U.S. regulations and land application. As Beth mentioned, I got to serve on um, uh, one of those. So in order to land apply biosolids, you have to comply with all of the following. Um, pathogen control, which are essentially engineered uh, process requirements, and that produces either a class A or a class B biosolids. Class A is essentially um, pathogen free. Uh, class B has some low level of uh, uh, pathogenic activity remaining but with management practices that are also required, uh, it provides the same level of safety as class A. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's a need to uh, require the biosolids are not a food source for any uh, organisms capable of carrying disease off like rodents or birds, and therefore vector attraction reduction is required. Um, and then we also need to meet pollutant concentration limits and these are what were set by comprehensive risk assessment uh, that EPA conducted. And then uh, we have to limit the application rate that we use for biosolids to um, provide the nitrogen need of the crop that's going to be grown. And that includes taking all nitrogen sources that may be applied on that site into account. One of the fundamental principles, I guess, is that, you know, that the biosolids world uh, understands is the regulation of biosolids is dynamic. Um, it's not intended to be static and it must remain based on sound science. And this is true for any uh, regulation that's designed to protect public health and the environment and has been the case for biosolids uh, since the Clean Water Act was adopted. Uh, an overarching finding of the NAS committee in 2002 uh, was to continually pursue research. 
Uh, and that recommendation was made not because one would expect to find adverse effects, but because it's a responsible course of action. Uh, as I mentioned, for any uh, regulation intended to protect public health. And uh, just sort of an observation is that when evaluating new constituents, and, and we make this um, known to EPA as well as uh, the state, it's important to consider the practical experience based on decades of land application and the net environmental impacts. Um, and I can talk about this a little bit more as well. But, you know, some of the things we recognize are opportunities within California. The land application of biocells provides all the following. Um, it improves soil tilth, it increases the soil organic carbon, uh, it increases the water holding capacity, which reduces the need to irrigate, which is extremely critical in the Western US uh, who are suffering from such severe drought. And to that end, it also uh, provides drought stress relief for crops. Uh, they are able to still thrive uh, much better, uh, even in drought conditions. Uh, that uniformly increases crop yields. It sequesters carbon long-term in the soil, mitigating climate change. And it also displaces fossil fuel-based inorganic fertilizer. It takes almost a quarter of a gallon of fossil fuel for to produce every pound of inorganic nitrogen. And it also importantly conserves non-renewable resources like phosphorus uh, and is able to then recycle them. Phosphorus, as we know, is a finite resource and um, estimates are that we will run out of phosphorus reserves, at least known phosphorus reserves in the world, um, somewhere between 50 and 100 years from now. Um, biosolids can help also reclaim disturbed sites such as Superfund and other mines, uh, brownfields and fire impacted land, which is extremely important in California. Uh, we also are looking now at restoration efforts in the San Francisco Bay uh, and the potential use of biosolids for those. Um, just some slides here showing you um, uh, <clears throat> a field without biosolids and one where with it, and uh, some other just photo examples. Um, obviously, something that is on everyone's um, mind these days are perfluorinated compounds, um, <clears throat> known as forever chemicals. Um, California's State Water Board issued an investigative order to all treatment plants within California that have design flows over 1 million gallons per day, um, requiring quarterly monitoring of influent and effluent. Uh, for 31 different PFAS. Um, also included in that order are for biosolids. Um, annually, if um, the design flow is between one and five MGD, and quarterly, if it is over five MGD. And then there is also um, an annual monitoring requirement for groundwater, if um, monitoring is already included in a permit. Um, this was required for one year, uh, essentially would have covered all of 2021. Um, however, there were, uh, there was some flexibility given for, um, actually it would have been, it was issued and uh, would have begun in the final quarter of 2020 and gone through the third quarter of 2021. Um, there was some flexibility given though for some uh, who could not begin in that fourth quarter of 2020. So they were given a one quarter delay, um, but everything will be done by the end of 2021. And the monitoring was required for one year. Um, results are uh, being tabulated in a public database in California called GeoTracker. Uh, we're still working on tabulating those results. Um, however, we have, um, you know, and so discussions are continuing though that we are having with the water board staff. Um, we're urging a uh, pragmatic approach rather than a draconian one. Uh, some states have taken extremely um, uh, 
aggressive um, positions with biosolids and effluent. Others have been much more uh, pragmatic and really uh, our argument is that we should focus on source control and make sure that we address contamination and contaminated sites um, and deal with source control where it's feasible. <clears throat> California has also been uh, very much a leader in mitigating climate change. There are a number of legislation um, articles which have been adopted over the last decade or more uh, to address climate change. And most of these, or all of them essentially, the wastewater sector can help the state achieve. These include uh, achieving a 40% reduction in uh, CO2 equivalent emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, below 1990 levels by 2030. Uh, we have to produce 50% um, of our energy from renewable sources by 2026. And that e increases up to 100% renewable by 2045. <clears throat> we also need to reduce the carbon intensity of transportation fuel by 20% by 2030. Um, and then a couple that I'll talk about in more detail, there's a short-lived climate pollutant reduction requirement adopted in SB 1383. And I'll speak about that um, in much more detail. Also, Governor Brown um, in 2015 introduced a Healthy Soils Initiative, uh, which also recognizes the key uh, benefits that biosolids can play uh, in achieving those uh, requirements. And that essentially was to ensure uh, sustainable agriculture for future generations of Californians. And more recently, under Governor Newsom, we have a Natural and Working Lands climate change implementation program uh, that also recognizes the benefits of biosolids. So SB 1383 requires the reduction of short-lived climate pollutants. And what that means essentially for the wastewater sector is methane. Um, this legislation was adopted in 2016 and it requires that we reduce methane emissions by 40% by 2030. And that's using 2013 as the baseline. And in order to achieve that, there's a requirement to divert organics away from landfills, including biosolids, um, by 75% uh, by 2025. And that's using 2014 as a baseline. As um, shown on an earlier slide, almost, uh, I think it's about 23% of our biosolids are currently used at landfills, and that no longer will be the case. Uh, so regulations to implement this legislation were adopted in 2020, November 2020, by CalRecycle. CalRecycle is um, the regulatory agency responsible for uh, recycling, as their name implies, but also management of solid waste, of which biosolids is a component. Um, so these regulations become effective January 1st of next year, and the state can begin enforcement um, on the effective date beginning in 2022. Uh, and what this uh, enforcement would apply to essentially, it requires every city and county, which are called jurisdictions, to <clears throat> enter into franchise agreements with solid waste haulers in order to um, ensure that organic waste can be collected and recycled effectively uh, at residents at residential units as well as commercial and industrial facilities <clears throat> uh, the state you know there was a little bit of a delay in the adoption of these regulations it took a bit longer than anticipated uh, which has caused some concern over uh, whether or not these agreements can all be um, executed by the beginning of the year. Uh, the state has agreed to use uh, some flexible enforcement discretion, uh, but there is also legislation now on the governor's desk awaiting signature that would essentially delay enforcement for a year. It would not delay any of the requirements, but it would delay the, um, the enforcement for a year. 
we expect the governor will likely sign that, but we don't know that for sure yet. Um, and then local jurisdictions can be, begin enforcement on January 1st, 2024. And that essentially means that those uh, franchise agreements in which they have um, entered uh, by January 1st, 2022, if those are not being fulfilled um, effectively, they could begin enforcement against those uh, haulers. Um, and then compliance with the landfill diversion mandate is required beginning January 1st of 2025. So some of the um, uh, key features of these regulations which impact biosolids and wastewater plants, um, they consider all biosolids which are anaerobically digested and or composted and then land applied to be a reduction in landfill disposal. Any other treatment or end use, including end uses which never see a landfill, including surface disposal or incineration, are still considered to be landfill disposal. Um, nothing in the regulations compels an agency to change the management option that they're utilizing, but those alternative options will still be considered landfill disposal. Fortunately, in, in California, roughly 95% um, of our biosolids are either anaerobically digested and or composted, and most of those are then land applied, um, but not all of them. And we think though that since biosolids are likely the cleanest organic waste there is out there, they'll be considered the low hanging fruit and thus the easiest to divert. And um, we don't expect that landfilling will remain as a viable option uh, beyond 2025. It's important to note that the state, uh, you know, we worked closely with the state as these regulations were being developed and they do recognize the wastewater sector as key to successfully implementing um, this legislation. So they included two incentives that uh, we really um, uh, advocated for, and they're intended to create markets. The first is to disallow local ordinances which unreasonably restrict or prohibit the land application of biosolids. And I'll talk about this more in a minute. And also every jurisdiction that has to divert organic waste must then procure some product of that diversion and eligible products include compost and or beneficial use of biogas. Um, so if local ordinances are disallowed, we expect that the statewide general order for land application will become increasingly relied upon um, as the governing law of the state. So there were some issues with the general order that we have identified and have recommended some revisions. Um, right now, it, it sort of is um, contradictory to the state regulation in that it allows uh, more restrictive local ordinances. So that's a piece that we think should be um, eliminated. <clears throat> it also has some cumulative pollutant loading rates that conflict with the federal regulations, as well as animal grazing, um, uh, waiting time is also in conflict with Part 503, and it applies to exceptional quality products, which uh, generally are considered equivalent to any other commercial fertilizer and not regulated uh, in the same way. Um, we don't know whether the State Board will do any update to the general order, and uh, nor do we know what changes they may recommend. So we'll continue to work with them on that. But here's a, a picture of the landscape in California in 2020. This color-coded uh, uh, landscape shows how difficult it is to land apply. <clears throat> Excuse me, you'll see a few counties in red and those have all out prohibitions on land application. Uh, the ones in orange have a ban on class B land application, meaning that they have to be uh, class A or exceptional quality. Uh, the pink ones have conditional use permit requirements, 
that vary. Some of those are much more restrictive, the mounting to essential bands, and others are much more reasonable and uh, easily complied with. Uh, but you'll see um, there's very few green counties, although they are important ones, Sonoma, Merced, Solano counties, especially uh, do receive a lot of biosolids from the Bay Area for land application. Um, what I should have said in uh, my overall biosolids management is roughly 13% of biosolids in California are actually land applied in Arizona. Uh, and that's because in Southern California, there really are limited options uh, in counties within California. Um, and it's uh, very unfortunate. Uh, so according to the new regulation, if in fact it, it bears out um, and these local ordinances are overturned or modified, uh, then the state should all turn green uh, by 2022. We will see if that in fact um, uh, occurs. Um, and just the other the other part of the mandate or the of the regulation with the market uh, provisions are, as I mentioned, that they every jurisdiction that has to divert organic waste has to procure some product of that diversion. So we assume, or the state assumes, uh, 0 0.08 tons of organic waste uh, is produced per resident per year, and uh, we have to then procure back um an associated amount of um, product uh, for each of those residents and that includes the eligible products include compost and beneficial uses of biogas uh, they can be used uh, they're very flexible in, in how this procurement occurs it could be uh, for on-site uh, gas production uh, it could be purchased it could be required by contract um, but a financial transaction is not required. And there's a lot of opportunities in terms of um, helping to achieve the organic diversion requirement. Uh, we have existing infrastructure uh, within the state to accept at least 75% of food waste, which is currently landfilled. Uh, we can accept it for co-digestion at our treatment plants. Uh, we can increase our biogas production thereby we and generate more renewable energy and we can turn that into low carbon transportation fuel, uh, pipeline grade renewable natural gas um, and thereby reduce greenhouse gas emissions and decrease fossil fuel use. Uh, we can build the healthy soils, sequestering carbon, reducing that fossil fuel intense inorganic fertilizer use uh, through land applied biosolids. And we recognize the need to develop collaborative partnerships uh, with the solid waste sector, especially uh, those managing organic waste uh, in terms of the solid waste collection. We have a, roughly 150 wastewater plants in the state uh, who utilize anaerobic digestion. Um, these are often located in urban areas near where the waste is generated. Um, there are some challenges though. We also have to build those partnerships uh, with the solid waste sector. Um, the, our two universes don't often intersect and now they will have to moving forward. Uh, we have to make sure that the organic waste stream uh, is clean enough for us to receive for co-digestion uh, or for composting. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we have to be assured of markets for uh, both biogas and biosolids. Now a 10 to 30% volumetric increase in food waste uh, can double the biogas produced. Um, <clears throat> again, there are some challenges. And I, I think I didn't mention, but should have that those 150 plants that, that employ anaerobic digestion represent uh, more than 90 percent of the wastewater flow in the state so it is really um, the majority of our wastewater <clears throat> some challenges though that we also uh, have to overcome is that local air districts impose limitations on 
uh, combustion engines, uh, emissions, uh, biogas volumes, and other restrictions. Um, we have two of the air basins with the worst air quality in the United States in the South Coast, which is the Los Angeles Basin, and in the Central Valley, uh, the San Joaquin Valley. <clears throat> and, in, and therefore, under Clean Air Act requirements, uh, they really have to eliminate um, ozone uh, production. And that means limiting uh, NOx, VOCs, and carbon monoxide, which may be emitted. Uh, so that's um, one big issue. Another is we have a lot of interest in pipeline injection of our biogas. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission in California has standards for that. Um, when they first came out, there were pretty restrictive heating and siloxane standards. They revised the heating uh, requirement, so uh, wastewater plants can now meet that. Siloxane standards remain a bit of a challenge. Um, there is legislation also, SB 1440, uh, that the Public Utilities Commission is implementing now. And in their recommendations, they are prioritizing biogas from wastewater plants and would require the investor owned utilities to procure uh, that biogas for pipeline injection. So that's a very viable opportunity. Um, you know, the IOUs uh, historically had not been very interested in receiving biogas from wastewater plants through pipeline injection. They are coming around and becoming much more accepting of it. However, there are still some cost and access issues uh, that have to be addressed. Um, US EPA's interpretation of the uh, renewable identification numbers under the renewable fuel standard. Um, is an issue, and I'll talk about that more in a few mo minutes. Um, and again, we, we need this market certainty in order to support capital investments. Um, and in California, we also have what's called the low carbon fuel standard. It goes in tandem with the renewable fuel standard and is an opportunity for um, our biogas, although there are some um, limitations to it that have to be addressed. And again, um, you know, scaling up for food waste acceptance um, is a challenge at wastewater plants. There are capital expenditures needed. There's pre-processing, as I mentioned, we have to be sure that uh, we have a clean enough feedstock that we're receiving. We have to have receiving facilities so that we could feed it into our digester over uh, time instead of a slug. Um, there's grip management issues and solids handling issues. And the risk is that, you know, the pre-processing technology is evolving quickly, but it is still uh, fairly immature. And it is not our core business. You know, wastewater plants uh, mission is to treat wastewater so that it can be safe, safely recycled or returned to the environment and to produce biosolids and safely return those to the environment. Uh, it, our core business does not include solid waste management nor energy production. So it's a little bit out of our ballywick and, and these efforts have to be at least uh, cost neutral. Um, there's also somewhat in parts of the state a lack of interested partners. Uh, we think that that will um, increase as the regulations become implemented, but currently it is cheaper to landfill organic waste and therefore in some parts of the state that continues until it will no longer be allowed. Uh, so that's an issue. And then in other parts of the state, there's competition for the feedstock. Uh, we have more plants that want the feedstock than is available. That too, I think will uh, mitigate itself um, as the regulations are implemented. And then again, we have the uncertain market for our, our products. Uh, the State Water Board commissioned a report to better quantify uh, our co-digestion capacity at existing plants. Uh, Corolla Engineers did this, and the purpose was to enable the Water Board to work with uh, the wastewater sector 
as well as local governments and community members uh, to better coordinate and cost effectively maximize uh, the organic waste diversion um, and to uh, maximize the co-digestion of wastewater plants and the beneficial use of our biogas and biosolids. And that report was completed in 2020 and is available now on the CASA website and, and elsewhere. And it did conclude that we do have the capability to um, accept all the food waste, which is currently being landfilled with some uh, upgrades and modifications needed. And just to talk a little bit about this renewable fuel standard issue, um, US EPA um, implements this program and it assigns the highest value credit to sewage sludge anaerobic digestion. Um, so unfortunately, it devalues that credit when we introduce organic waste directly into the digester for co-digestion. Um, so the highest value credit is called a D3 RIN, which is known as a cellulosic fuel. And when we turn our biogas into transportation fuel, um, if we are co-digesting, we get what's called an advanced biomass fuel value which is a D5, and that fluctuates, but it's generally only 10 to 25% of the value of a D3 REN. So we have been meeting with EPA officials uh, multiple times since 2017, and by we, um, it's a national coalition um, of wastewater treatment plants and uh, associations representing them. Um, and we had been, um, uh, discouraged, I guess, by most of our previous meetings. However, we had a Zoom meeting in July of 2021, uh, at which um, I came away very cautiously optimistic, and I'm in the process of gathering uh, supporting data from across the nation. <clears throat> what we have been arguing is that food waste is an integral part of sewage sludge. It's already received through the sewage system um, and at the headworks. Um, by receiving it that way, we lose up to 40% of its energy value uh, through the activated sludge process. So it's much more efficient and effective to introduce it uh, directly into the digester where we're able to conserve 100% of its energy. Um, so we were requesting that all biogas from the wastewater digestion be awarded the D3 RINs. Um, we have been... Um, stymied in that request and uh, that has formally been declined in a letter in 2019. <clears throat> we met again um, with EPA in December of, or um, in February of 2020, and again via Zoom uh, in July of this year. And we're now advancing our plan B. And what plan B is, is determine a baseline biogas production uh, from sludge digestion alone and that's incorrect. It's not based on volatile solids feed, but rather based on volatile solids destruction. Um, and so we're advocating that that baseline production should be 15 standard cubic feet of biogas produced for every pound of volatile solids destroyed. <clears throat> and we assign that volume a D3 value, and then we assume that all other biogas produced would be a product of co-digestion and award that a D5. So this would be a portioning of uh, the REN values. And uh, we're also compiling data on our mean cell residence time and volatile solids uh, reduction, which are both requirements of the 503 regulations for land application. And this would give confidence to EPA that digestion actually occurs. Uh, that was one of their concerns. Um, so we are in the process of compiling data from across the nation, which we will be uh, submitting to EPA. And then just, uh, uh, just a final note uh, for you to be aware of, the EPA Office of Inspector General pro produced a report that was released in November of 2018. We felt it was a biased and sensational indictment of the EPA biosolids program. It implied that land application is unsafe, 
until a full risk assessment is conducted on some 352 constituents. Uh, as soon as this report came out, we began to work with researchers at the University of Arizona, Ohio State, Purdue, uh, within some of our members uh, to rebut the report conclusions. And we developed a rebuttal report that was released in July of 2020. And it was released by what's called the W4170 Committee. That's a USDA multi-state research committee, which is essentially made of uh, university researchers from across the nation who work at land-grant universities. Um, and with that, I am happy to answer any questions. I'll see if I can end my presentation. Yeah, actually, if you could leave up your contact slide, so I'll okay. see that for a while. While you're getting that back up, I will remind our audience that you can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar. I'll be reading those to Greg. Okay, so our first question is, can you please confirm that the January 1st, 2022 and January 1st, 2024 state and local enforcement dates do not include the enforcement of the diversion requirements and the and the enforcement of diversion requirements will not occur until January 1st, 2025. That is uh, correct. Um, the enforcement um, um, that will occur or is scheduled to occur January 1st, 2022 would be the state enforcing upon jurisdictions uh, primarily for failure to enter into franchise hauler agreements to ensure the organic waste produced in their jurisdiction can be recycled and collected uh, effectively. And then the January 1st, 2024 enforcement would be where local jurisdictions can enforce against those franchise haulers for failing to uh, fulfill the obligations of that agreement. And compliance with the diversion mandate uh, doesn't take effect until January 1, 2025. And I should say that there would be no enforcement against a wastewater treatment plant. It's always going to be on that on a jurisdiction. Uh, it's not on the wastewater treatment plant. Hmm. Our next question is. When biosolids or manure is applied to meet crop nitrogen needs, this often results in an overapplication of phosphorus. At one time, it was thought that this phosphorus would be retained in the soil, but now it is known that this phosphorus can leach into ground and surface waters. Does California or any other state regulate land application of phosphorus in biosolids? Um, phosphorus is a big issue in certain parts of the country, certainly in the Midwest, um, and not so much in California. California has not uh, taken any action to regulate uh, application based on phosphorus. However, there is a big difference between manure and biosolids and commercial fertilizer. The, the really important component of phosphorus is what's called the water extractable uh, phosphorus. And research at the University of Florida and Penn State have really shown that phosphorus in biosolids remains bound because of the heavy um, amounts of iron and aluminum and oxides uh, that bind that phosphorus up. So it's important that we do um, an analysis for the water extractable portion of the phosphorus and base application limitations on that, not on total phosphorus. And there's a comparison um, done in that work uh, between uh, different types of manure, dairy, uh, uh, cattle, poultry, um, 
and commercial fertilizer. So all of those have far higher water extractable phosphorus levels, which is a concern. Biosolids are a fraction of, of that. Um, as I say, because of the aluminum and, and iron uh, naturally occurring in the biosolids. In Wisconsin, I know, because I, when I was a regulator there, we started requiring water extractable phosphorus analysis uh, back in around 2003, 2004. Uh, so there's now, you know, 16, 17 years worth of data on the water extractable phosphorus um, uh, level in biosolids. And the University of Wisconsin, when they developed their phosphorus index, included a placeholder for that so that the P index would base it upon the WEP uh, value for biosolids. Um, I don't know that that's being utilized widely yet in Wisconsin, but it should be. Um, and so that, in my opinion, at least. And so that's um, something to look at. Certainly in, in the mid-Atlantic states, phosphorus is also an issue there. I know states are looking at uh, limitations on phosphorus. I think Maryland may have adopted some um, limits. But again, I don't think that they are looking at the water extractable P, which is really um, the critical factor. Another viewer writes, hello, thank you for the overview of biosolids in California. Is there any interest from stakeholders to use biosolids as a feedstock for biocarbon, in other words, biochar making? If not, is there a specific reason? It seems that uh, would solve many issues raised in the regulations. Thank you. Well, there, um, there is interest and the main limitation has been um, the fact that the wastewater sector is somewhat conservative in, um, in adopting new technologies and need verification that those technologies will work. To produce biochar, you would need either gasification or paralysis. Um, and those have not been fully demonstrated in the US. Now, that being said, there is a facility in California, Silicon Valley Clean Water, in Redwood City on the San Francisco Peninsula, who does have a paralysis system in place um, that appears to be working fairly well. Um, they um, are, I think, still investigating uh, markets for the use of the biochar, but they are producing it. Um, there's also a project nearing the end of construction in Linden, New Jersey, by a company called Aries Technology, which is a gasification unit that will operate, I believe, on 100% biosolids. So a lot of eyes are um, looking to that to see how well it performs. Others that have been operational in the US um, have not worked. Um, well, there was one in Sanford, Florida that ultimately failed a gasification system. Um, so uh, it's new technology at least uh, on biosolids. Gasification and paralysis work on woody biomass very well. That's well documented. Um, and there is actually one in Tennessee that works on 10% wood and, or 10% biosolids and 90% wood. Um, but for them to work on 100% biosolids is still unknown for the most part. Um, and then the markets for the biochar, I think, are also uh, still developing. Uh, so far, we haven't had any more questions come in through the questions box. So I will ask one and see if any more come in in the meantime. Um, so if a state doesn't have any regulations related to biosolids and they're interested in enacting regulations to promote biosolids use, uh, where would you recommend they get started? How do they get started? 
Well, I think all states have some biosolids regulation. Um, as I say, when I used to represent all the states to EPA, um, I think every state had at least some uh, regulation. Um, so I, I guess is the question whether or not um, uh, where they would look for like a model regulation if they were to develop more robust robust ones. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, as uh, not to be uh, self-serving, but I highly recommend the Wisconsin regulations. I think they were very pragmatic, very good, um, protective of the environment, and. Uh, I 99% of the utilities in Wisconsin land apply. Um, you know, 503 is certainly a good baseline, and uh, that's one that could also and has been adopted in some states, uh, sort of the model. Um, Washington State has always had good regulations. There's a number of them uh, that are out there. Uh, but I would, being the most familiar with it, um, you know, California is a little bit tough because um, in California, every lower unit of government can be more restrictive than the one above it. Uh, so it makes for somewhat of a patch quilt. Uh, whether that gets remedied through these new regulations, uh, we will see. Uh, but in Wisconsin is the opposite of that, where the state has preemptive authority for biosolids. And uh, so there the state regulation is the law of the land. And like I say, I think that those are uh, fairly uh, pragmatic and, and protective and good regulations. Uh, another one of my own. Um, what is the most common barrier to land application of biosolids that you've seen over the years? Well, and um, in California, it's really a rural urban uh, issue because most of the biosolids are produced on the heavily populated coastal communities. Um, but land application occurs in the agricultural parts of the state, which tend to be much more in the Central Valley. Therefore, you have large urban centers bringing their biosolids to less populated rural parts of the state um, for land application. And that has created some um, friction. In the early days of land application in California, which would be the 1990s, um, there was probably some arrogance on the part of some municipalities where there was some reluctance to fix roads, uh, limit hours of operation, and other, um, you know, fundamental good neighbor practices uh, that I think were, this was before my time there, but I think that's what caused a lot of those ordinances to be developed. Um, those programs now um, are very responsible, very well managed, and very conducive to good neighbor relations. Uh, so I don't think that they any longer are an issue and in fact, there haven't been any new ordinances since 2007 um, in California. Uh, and I actually have had calls from some counties wondering why they have such a restrictive ordinance when farmers want file salads. Uh, so it's, I think, a whole new uh, set of people and um, situations uh, that hopefully will eliminate that issue. But that's what we have seen in California. I would say it's mostly the rural urban dispute. Uh, other parts of the country, odors have been an issue. Uh, there, you know, just like manure, there are some odors uh, that can be associated with biosolids. And if you don't have enough separation uh, to neighbors, uh, that can cause problems. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, so one from our audience. Do you have any consideration or regulation on the emerging contaminants, such as pharmaceuticals and personal care products that might be in biosolids? Well, this is an area of continual science and research. Um, 
very much uh, being looked at. Uh, we have not found um, no cause for um, you know additional regulation at this point because uh, you know pharmaceuticals are certainly uh, going to be several degrees of separation from any exposure out uh, that would um, wind up uh, impacting humans at this point. But then we also generally those are going to be in extremely low concentrations. Um, but it is something constantly looked at and actually EPA just yesterday announced uh, six million dollars in research grants being awarded to look at this very topic. Uh, there were four grants each of about a million and a half dollars that will run between this fall beginning around October 1st and concluding sometime late fall, late summer, early fall of 2024. And they are all intended to look at emerging contaminants um, in biosolids, uh, such as pharmaceuticals, PFAS, um, et cetera. Um, you know, I guess this is where that point that I made on um, the need to look holistically um, at decades of land application uh, when considering these minute concentrations of, of new contaminants and recognize that over decades of application there has not been one documented adverse effect case um, found from biosolids but there have been uh, multitudes of benefits realized through that improved soil uh, health as well as crop yields, etc. So, uh, whatever has been there or is in biosolids has generally been there for some time. You know, through the years, we just weren't able to analyze it in the past. Um, a, a great example, if I might just uh, finish with this, is the city of Los Angeles owns a 5,000 acre farm in the in Kern County in the Central Valley of California. And when they uh, uh, began applying on that farm, it was called the Poverty Farm. It had a pH of about 10.5 and nothing would grow on it. It looked like the moon. Now, some 25 years later, it produces two crops a year, black fertile soil, a pH of about 7.8. Um, to me, a picture tells a thousand words and or something like that. It's, uh, but it's a great example of showing uh, the sustained benefits of land application. Um, and so uh, we always have to be cognizant of new chemicals and new constituents and make sure that uh, nothing is going to cause an adverse impact. Uh, but we also have to look at the practical realities and our experience. Yes, very encouraging. Uh, so we are coming up on our hour mark. Um, if you think of a question later, or we didn't get to your question, uh, Greg's contact information is on the screen right now. Uh, so what final thoughts would you like to leave us with? Um, just as uh, it's probably obvious, but I am a, a strong proponent of land application as uh, a beneficial and sustainable use for something that Society will continue to produce and in higher and greater quantities all the time. Uh, so it's important that we are able to sustainably uh, recycle it. And I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you. And thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Good to see you all. Bye. Bye-bye.